The modus operandi in deep learning has been building bigger and larger models on larger amounts of data. And these models are incredibly over-parameterized. The lottery ticket hypothesis is one of the most exciting ideas in deep learning. This won the best paper award at ICLR 2019 by providing a massive step in the direction of training neural networks with less computing power, making deep learning more accessible and environment friendly. Today, we are talking to Jonathan Frankel. Jonathan made waves in the machine learning community last year when he released his lottery ticket hypothesis. Connor and Yannick and I we were so excited about the paper that we've all made videos about it on our respective channels. Deep learning has been mainly the field of scaling up, building more and more parameters and more and more layers into neural networks. But another field, pruning, has been doing the exact opposite. We take these giant networks and we compress them down after we've trained them. The lottery ticket hypothesis and its surrounding body of work is so interesting because it states that these pruned networks are already present at the beginning of training. And if we could only tell which ones they are, we wouldn't need the entire rest. So this has been an absolutely fascinating topic for me, and I'm absolutely excited that we can explore this today. Jonathan is a part-time researcher at FAIR, where he's been working on the early phase of neural network training, which is gonna be published in iClear this year. And he's also been working on training batch norm and batch norm only, which which has been accepted as an oral at NeurIPS this year and has also been submitted to ICML. Jonathan is on the OECD network of experts to discuss AI principles and the measure of AI progress in OECD countries. He's an adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center. He was a student researcher on the Google Brain Team in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's a member of the Computer Science Advisory Council at Princeton University, and he also interned at Microsoft in Redmond. He's currently completing his PhD at MIT, focusing on his work around the lottery ticket hypothesis. He's completed a bachelor's and a master's in computer science from Princeton University, focusing on cryptography and distributed computation. This week, we reached out to the Machine Learning Reddit. We wanted to hear your questions, and so many of you responded, and we had nearly 100 upvotes, which is incredible. We asked many of your questions to Jonathan, so please uh, stay tuned to hear your questions answered by the man himself. The lottery ticket hypothesis demonstrated that with a tiny fraction of the amount of connections in your network, you could retrain given the same initialization and you could get even better accuracy on the test set. This was incredibly intriguing. It seemed to tease that the only reason that we needed these huge um, over-parameterized networks was because they were a bit like lumps of clay. They contained a combinatorial explosion of possible sub-networks. And we needed to have all of those different combinations for SGD to find the relevant sub-network that would provide a useful inductive prior for our problem. In, in the original lottery ticket hypothesis, it was only trained on datasets like CIFAR 10 and MNIST on fairly small architectures. It wasn't trained on the image nets of this world on things like VGG and, and ResNet. Jonathan has now done some really interesting work to demonstrate that the reason it doesn't scale is because of the instability in the earlier phase of training. And that instability is caused by stochastic gradient descent. It, it has this kind of noise associated with it because it's taking random samples and feeding it to the training process out of order. But even the larger architectures, they stabilize very quickly. So the take home message here is that if you train for a little bit longer before you start pruning, then you can find winning tickets that still scale up to these larger architectures. Since the original lottery ticket hypothesis paper, Jonathan and his collaborators have continued the pursuit of understanding sparse networks, pruning neural networks, and lottery tickets, recently publishing some incredibly exciting papers. Linear mode connectivity introduces instability to predict the training success of a lottery ticket subnetwork. This is a huge step towards sparse networks from scratch and reducing the computational cost of training deep neural networks. Stabilizing the lottery ticket hypothesis uses the stability analysis to provide insight into how early these massive neural networks can be pruned to find the lottery ticket. In addition to stability analysis, Frankel has worked on the early phase of neural network training, describing behavior of weights at different steps of training, such as the behavior of gradient magnitudes and when rewinding becomes effective. 
rewinding this idea of resetting weights to their value at a previous training step rather than completely to initialization was further explored in comparing rewinding and fine tuning in neural network pruning. In this paper, they make a surprising discovery that you can keep the same weight after pruning and only rewind the learning rate. Jonathan has also collaborated on an exhaustive survey of pruning itself. They survey 81 papers and take pruning apart along dimensions of pruning individual or groups of weights, scoring metrics used to prune, scheduling, and fine-tuning after pruning neural networks. Frankel has also collaborated on a fairly surprising paper titled Training Batch Norm and Only Batch Norm on the expressive power of random features in CNNs. Many of us forget that batch norm has trainable scale and shift parameters. In this study, they showed training only those parameters can reach 83% accuracy on CIFAR-10 with an 866 layer ResNet. Also joining us today is Dr. Matthew Salvaris. Matthew is a deep learning scientist at iRobot. He was a principal data scientist lead at Microsoft for the last four years, and that's where I met him. He was studying cognitive neuroscience at UCL, and he has a master's, a PhD, and a postdoc in computer science from the University of Essex. His specialism was in brain-computer interfaces. It was an incredible opportunity to talk to Jonathan. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you back here next week. So um, we are here. Uh, this is the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel, and we have Jonathan Frankel from MIT. And Jonathan is absolutely famous because his paper called The Lottery Ticket Hypothesis uh, just got an incredible amount of traction in the community. And I, I think um, it was so inspiring for, for many of us. Actually, all of us on our respective YouTube channels have done a video on the Lottery Ticket Hypothesis. And it raises so many fascinating questions. It, it's almost like we're, we're looking for a useful inductive prior and deep learning. And with, with these densely connected neural networks, it's almost like we're throwing everything and, but the kitchen sink at a problem. We have this big block of of clay and we're kind of chipping away at the clay using stochastic gradient descent until we find one of these sub networks that seems to resonate with the algorithm but when we do find this sub network it, it seems to be a good inductive prior it trains better and generalizes better but with some caveats so i think we've discovered recently that it doesn't work say on ImageNet and on some of the more complex architectures go ahead jonathan that, that's correct so far. So the w would you like me to chat a little bit about the scaling question in particular or just talk about the big idea? What's what, um, what's your what question? Maybe, maybe maybe first maybe first uh, just um, some 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 person in a cave somewhere might not have heard about the big idea. So if you just give your talk your particular talk on the big idea or your particular take on it, that would be actually also interesting for everyone, right? Perfect. So we we know that neural networks are gigantic. And in fact, we, we know that we can make them smaller after we train them. This isn't something new. This is something that we've known since the 1980s, since before I was born, probably since before anybody who's on this podcast was born. Um, so the, this is old news. I didn't invent pruning or anything like that. And all you do is you take a network and you train it, and then you remove a bunch of parts, train it a little bit more, and you find that you get about the same accuracy, which is surprising. It's, you know, I, I wouldn't have intuitively thought that. But the lesson you take away from that is that whatever function you learned, whatever you were trying to learn with this model, it had a representation that was relatively small. In fact, it could have fit in a much smaller network than the one you started with. So we know that. Now, the lottery ticket hypothesis question, the, the really the motivating question here is, you know, we know the representation could have been smaller. Could the, could the network we trained from the beginning have been smaller? This is the animating question for this entire line of work. And if you, one naive thing you might ask is, well, I've got this smaller architecture that I got after training. What if I just tried training using that from the beginning? And this doesn't work very well. This is, you know, this is no better than, you know, just kind of randomly pruning the network than doing a lot of things that, that don't work very well. And so there's this lingering question in the literature on pruning, you know, why is it that you can't train these smaller networks from the start? Maybe the learning process actually just requires more capacity. Maybe there's something harder about learning a problem than there is about actually representing whatever you've learned in the end. And this intuitively makes sense. When I think about learning calculus, that was really hard. That took a lot of work. When I think about recalling the knowledge that I've synthesized about calculus, you know, it's not so hard anymore. It doesn't require as much brain power. And so maybe that was true for neural networks. 
And the lottery ticket idea was that maybe these smaller networks can train from the beginning, but maybe it's all about the lucky initialization that we gave to these subnetworks. So when we when we create a neural network from scratch, we randomly initialize all the connections. And perhaps this smaller architecture you got from pruning could learn from the beginning. It was just that you know you needed to it needed to get a lucky initialization. It, it got some good initialization at the beginning that allowed it to learn from scratch. And so maybe the entire initialization process is just a giant lottery. We're sampling subnetworks, hoping that one of these happens to get lucky. That ends up being what drives the optimization process. And then in the end, you know, we could we could prune down to this network. We could have taken it back to the beginning. We could train it again, and it would work just as well. So you know, this is a pretty big claim. This is rather ambitious. This is, you know, rather controversial. And the only way that you can support this is with evidence. So the evidence was, you know, taking these networks, training them to completion, pruning them, and then asking the question, could I have trained this prune network from the beginning with the same initialization? Trying it. And so in the original paper, I tried this a bunch of times in a lot of small networks, and it worked. And, you know, boom, I had a cool paper and a cool hypothesis. <laughs> Well, I'm really excited about this idea of, of the sparse networks from scratch. And could you tell us more about the linear mode connectivity and how that might get us closer to being able to prune this quicker without having to fully train these deep networks? Definitely. So the linear mode connectivity, I need to take a step back to explain that idea. <laughs> So the lottery ticket hypothesis, the original experiment I just described, where you you know you prune a network, you go back to the beginning and see if it'll still train, this doesn't seem to work on larger scale networks. And you know this is something we figured out at the end of the original paper. A bunch of other people pointed it out afterwards. They tried to scale this up, and that was kind of disappointing. You know, it, maybe this idea only applies to small networks. Maybe you know this isn't this doesn't explain neural networks in general. The hypothesis is wrong. All that good stuff. And so we took a step back and we asked, you know, why might this be going on? What what might be driving the lottery ticket properties to work and what might be causing them to fail? And we figured out that on large scale networks, if we go almost all the way back to the beginning, but not all the way, just almost all the way, then things work again. So there's a small subnetwork that would train from early in training. And now you have this great scientific setup. It you know, it seems like a disappointment, but it actually became an opportunity. We we can ask, if you go back just a little further, things don't work. If you go back just a little later, things do work. What changed? What's different here? It's a, it's a natural experiment. And the answer ended up being what we're calling instability. And the question of instability is kind of how, how consistent is the result of training a neural network if you change the, the sample of SGD noise? Stochastic gradient descent is a noisy process. It's stochastic. That's why they call it SGD. And so the question was, well, what is the effect of this stochasticity on the outcome of training? And what we ended up finding was that if you can take this same lottery ticket network and it always trains to about the same place, it always trains to about the same optimum, it trains to high accuracy. It trains really well. It's as good as the original network. If it doesn't train to the same optimum, it seems to be worse. It seems to kind of be, you know, it gets taken over by the by the chaos of SGD noise. And our hypothesis is that these smaller networks are just more likely to get stuck somewhere. So if it's if it's inconsistent in where it ends up, it'll probably get stuck somewhere most of the time. Whereas if it's consistent, for some reason, it seems to follow a good trajectory and end up in a good part of the optimization landscape. Maybe even this the same part that the full network ended up in, although we don't currently have evidence to support that fact. But it would be cool if we could find that out. So do, do you see there a connection between the, the difficulty of the problem and let's say how much instability you have? Because it seems on, on easy problems like MNIST or CIFAR 10, already the subnetwork at the very beginning is already stable, so to say, um, right? But then with ImageNet, it seems like you have to train for a bit until the subnetwork becomes stable. Do you, do you think there's a connection to the, to the difficulty of the problem and if I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> so it's a tricky, instability is a tricky, complicated property that we're still sorting out. Instability seems to be very predictive for these lottery ticket subnetworks. But it, and we, we've also looked at instability on just standard neural networks, and we find that most networks are unstable at the beginning. We, in fact, all the networks we've looked at down to pretty simple tasks are unstable at the beginning and become stable pretty early in training, which is interesting. It means that, you know, after a couple percent of the way into training, the outcome of optimization is basically determined and SGD noise isn't really changing your trajectory at all. 
No, or at least different samples of noise aren't. Maybe the noise is having some other beneficial property. People hypothesize it has something to do with generalization. But in terms of actually changing where you end up, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But it doesn't really have anything to do with accuracy, we think, on these dense networks. We, At least, you know, these dense networks are training to full performance and you know, they seem to be unstable at the beginning. However, for the sparse networks, instability seems to make a big difference, which I think highlights the possibility that these sparse networks are getting stuck somewhere along the way, unless they have this good property. These sparse networks are just much more prone to getting trapped in some local minimum somewhere along the way and can't get to the good minimum at the end. Yeah, so, is instability related to generalization? So what you're saying is that... Um, Essentially, the take-home message of, of the linear mode paper is that you should only start pruning when stability is achieved. But what is stability? Is, is stability um, about having local generalization to different samples of data? Because that's what SGD is. It's giving different samples of data. And when you reach a level of maturity and training where stability is reached, then all of a sudden it's resistant to that noise. So I wouldn't say resistant to that noise. It's the it's a it's a subtle property where the the outcome of optimization will remain the same regardless of the sample of noise. But if you were to change the distribution of noise, if you were to increase the batch size or change the learning rate, something that would change the distribution of noise, I'm betting you would end up in a different place and get different performance. So the property really has to do with whether the network kind of gets knocked off track by SGD noise in a sense. And you, it's a good question that you and our ICML reviewers asked about whether you know instability is predictive of generalization. And the answer is for these sparse subnetworks, it is. And the reason probably is that instability really represents some proxy for whether the network is getting knocked off course and then getting stuck somewhere. For the dense networks, though, we hypothesize that they just have so many parameters that they're unlikely to get stuck. Wherever, whatever course they take, they're likely to keep on going until they find a minimum that generalizes well. So could, is it, is it fair to say it? that you've gone to your lottery ticket hypothesis where you say you hypothesized maybe the training process benefits from this overparameterization, and you came to the sort of conclusion with your initial evidence that no, it actually doesn't. Actually, we don't even need this overparameterization for training as long as we have the good initialization, right? And now it almost seems to come back again to say, actually... In, in some cases, in, in bigger cases, we do need that initial overparameterization to reach the stability uh, regime. So, I, I think that's right. I think that, you know, this is like like any good scientific process. You know, there is, you know, we had our original hypothesis. We have kind of the the counterpoint that you know, maybe this doesn't work on larger scale networks. And we have this nice synthesis at the end where, you know, perhaps on larger scale networks, there's a period where you may need the dense network. And then after that, you may be able to prune once and then keep that sparsity for the entire rest of the way. And so, you know, maybe at some high level, and this is pure speculation, that maybe there is kind of some explore exploit trade off going on here. Maybe during this initial phase, the network is exploring, trying to find kind of a groove in the optimization landscape over which it can, you know, make progress. And then after that point, we could have pruned. Now, the one other caveat I want to throw in there is these results are all contingent on one particular strategy for trying to find these lottery tickets, and it's not a very good strategy. There's no reason to believe that pruning at the end should tell you very much about what you could have pruned early on. So it's entirely possible that you know some better strategy for finding lottery tickets will mean that we don't need this initial phase of dense training. This is you know we're limited by the techniques we have to explore this, and I hope that folks come up with better methodologies, better algorithms for finding these lottery tickets. That would make a huge difference. I think that could completely change these results. There's another. Jo oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, jo go ahead. Oh, like Jonathan, so pivoting into better techniques for finding these lottery tickets, this rewinding algorithm where you re, where you do the iterative magnitude pruning and then you retrain it, but you just retrain it by restoring the learning rate. I thought that was really interesting that you have that, like you don't reset the weight, but you reset the learning rate. Can you tell me a little bit more about how important it is to have some kind of cyclical learning rate then? And like, doesn't that add more complexity with the learning rate now? Or I'm just curious about like how you figured out this learning rate could be reset. So this is a this is a great question about our recent iClear paper. Uh, the first author, Alex Renda, who's a student in our lab, um, you know, worked really hard on this for the past year, and he got an oral at iClear on this paper. So the 
let me let me kind of give some context for this because it, it takes on a slightly different problem than what we've been discussing. So the lottery ticket work is all about trying to understand was there a sparse subnetwork early in training that could have done the same work as the full network? Could we have basically replaced training the full network with a smaller network? The particular paper you're talking about, um, which is comparing rewinding and fine tuning and neural network pruning, is all about asking the question, well, you know, if we find a lottery ticket, we've also found a pruned network. Because, you know, you just take that lottery ticket, train it to completion, and now you've got a pruned neural network. Is this a good pruned neural network? How does it compare? What are the sparsities we get out of the lottery ticket networks, and how do they compare to what we got from state-of-the-art sparsity? And so what we did was we just tried taking the lottery ticket algorithm and asking these pruned networks that we get, how do they do compared to st standard pruned networks from other techniques? And the answer was actually pretty good. In fact, about state-of-the-art. And then we tried tweaking one thing. So in standard lottery ticket, you would take your network, train it to the end, prune it, go back to the beginning or go back early on, and then redo this whole process. Now, if your goal is just to get a small network at the end, you don't really care how you get there, maybe you should just keep the weights you had at the end of training. Maybe you shouldn't go back. This is what people typically do in pruning. So the only difference is you take the learning rate for, that you would have gotten from rewinding, but you don't bother to reset the weights. And it turns out that this gets you even better performance. In fact, this kind of, we found for sparse pruning matches state of the art across a wide range of you know networks and, a, and matches a bunch of state of the art techniques that are way more complicated. My hope for this is that not that this is you know the pruning algorithm that everybody will use forever, but that this is such a simple baseline that you know if you want to advertise a new pruning algorithm, you know beat this, like put this line on your paper and show that your line is better like it would be most exciting to me if in the next five years i see our line get crushed by a bunch of other lines because that would suggest that we're making some progress in pruning which is you know i'm not sure we've really made that much progress in the past 10 years anyway that's a separate paper that we worked on in the fall um just quickly to to that point that you said about the rewinding of the learning rate how do you so we kind of had an understanding of what the weights might be a good to be rewound to a certain point but why would the learning rate just rewinding the learning rate um like offer such a good solution. So let me let me take the alternate perspective and ask what we were doing before we proposed learning rate rewinding, yeah. which is that once you prune the network, you train it for a little while. This is called fine tuning at the lowest learning rate or at some lower learning rate you had during the training process. And the I the the kind of intuition behind that is that maybe you know you're already late in the training process, you're already close to the optimum, you just need to do a little bit of extra training and you don't want to rock the boat too much. That was kind of the intuition, but I might ask, you know, what's the justification for that learning rate over any other learning rate? And so in some sense, by going to this, what really is a cyclic learning rate schedule, where after we prune, we increase the learning rate back to a high learning rate and then work our way back down. You know, it's, I have a lot of speculation as to why that might work, but it's really pure speculation. But by that same token, you know, all we have to support the fine tuning process we did before is also pure speculation. So in some sense, this is an area where we don't really have much to go on right now, and there's an opportunity to do some really good science. Do you think the, the fact that you prune is constraining your, your function that you represent so much that basically you can now rock the boat more without going out of this optimum uh, you were? So if you basically leave out the, the small connection in the network, those might screw you up, but you only, you only, remain, you only retain the large weights uh, those were the ones that basically led you to the current optimum, and that optimum is probably pretty steep in those directions. Therefore, you might as well jack up the learning rate a bit, and you probably won't leave it. That's one good hypothesis, and it's not a bad idea. I think the, the question in my mind is always, I don't love to speculate wildly unless I have an experiment where I can validate that speculation. And you know, when I do that, then I write a paper. And so I'm trying to think in my mind now about how you would evaluate this. And one way to do that would be actually to maybe take some of the ideas from our linear mode connectivity paper and combine them here. Maybe you know, see whether you leave the optimum by, by trying to linearly interpolate between the result of doing this doing different kinds of fine tuning and you know the network you had at the end of training to see whether maybe you leave the optimum or maybe whether different learning rate schedules have different results but the you know if if training at this higher learning rate doesn't leave the optimum then you have to ask the question why did it make a difference if you're kind of in the same optimum then what was the what was the point of of increasing the learning rate and so i think there may be more to it than that but we have a few ideas that we're thinking about i don't want to speculate too much because i 
you know, wild speculation must be accompanied by experiments that can evaluate that wild speculation. And I don't have an experiment yet. <laughs> this, this leads um, maybe so. This leads into a question that we uh, got on Reddit, but I think Connor, you had something more topical to say. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to backtrack one up quickly. I, I just want to get a better understanding of so with linear mode connectivity. It looks to me we're training two copies of the same network, and they're getting different batches of data, and that's how we're doing the comparison. Could you just explain a little further on how we're describing them being connected? Definitely. That, that's a fantastic question. So the idea is that suppose we have two neural networks and we want to compare them somehow. We want to understand kind of how similar they are to each other. There are so many ways of doing this. There, there, there's a method called CCA that you know looks at looks at the similarity of the representations. You could look at which examples they classify the same and which examples they classify differently. Um, you could look at the the L2 distance between the parameterizations. And one way that we tried a bunch of these, and they're all you know buried in the appendices of the paper. But one way that we found that kind of gave some really clean results was asking, are they in the same optimum? That is to say, can you take the representations of these two networks and find a path between them over which loss doesn't increase? So can you find some valley that connects these networks? And this has been done. There, there are a couple of great papers from 2018 that show that for, in most cases, on standard neural networks, you can actually do this. You can, then all trained neural networks seem to be part of one giant high dimensional valley, and you can find relatively simple paths between them. But you can't find linear paths between them. And we ended up finding that, you know, for, for, a specific, for the specific examples we looked at in Lottery Ticket, the presence of linear paths seem to be very predictive of whether these networks train to good accuracy, which may suggest that although these networks are in some giant connected optimum, it may be that the, the linear connection suggests some kind of greater degree of similarity or some, some you know, better relationship or some tighter relationship between the networks than you would get with a nonlinear path. And so that's all it is. We're looking to see, you know, what happens on the loss landscape as you go from one representation to the other. Do you encounter some big barrier, which would suggest that they're not in linearly connected optima? Or, or can you just go along this flat path where all the networks in between are kind of equally good? And we ended up finding that in a lot of these lottery ticket situations. And we found a bunch of cases for standard networks where this also happens. So the question, the question uh, we got from Reddit that is sort of related to what you were saying before from um, SB Saya Paul, is how do you go about research in general and what are your approach towards picking up research topics and then pursue them in an interesting manner kind of high level? You, you've, you've talked a bunch about, oh, we had this idea, we had this idea, we had this idea. As we all know, most ideas don't work out. So how, how, what's your process? <laughs> So if all my ideas had worked out, we'd be talking about 60 papers instead of, you know, four or five papers. So they, in some sense, you know, you fail a lot. A lot of things don't work. I have tons of little manuscripts that are sitting in my computer right now of all sorts of things that I thought might have been interesting that completely failed. Um, you know, there's a lot of failure on the path to the couple of lottery ticket papers we wrote and a lot of things I've tried along the way that didn't work. Even things, if you look at the earlier archive versions of a lot of these papers, you'll you'll see that. I, I love to encourage folks to go and look at the archive V1 of lottery ticket if you want to see how the idea evolved and how, you know, my maturity as a researcher evolved. That original paper was pretty rough to be polite to my former self and, you know, pretty terrible if if you want to be direct about it. But in terms of, you know, how we pick ideas, in my mind, you know, the questions I'm interested in are the scientific ones. How can we gain an understanding of how of the phenomena that we see in, in neural networks by doing scientific experiments? How can we design a good experiment that will somehow evaluate a hypothesis as to why something is happening? So I like to do this kind of empirical scientific work. Beyond that, I mean, you know, the human condition of a PhD student is learning how to do research, how to ask nebulous questions, make them testable, evaluate, get to an answer, write a paper, iterate. And in some sense, that comes from practice and experience and a lot of a lot of things going wrong. So, uh, Jonathan, did you kind of discover this like by the lottery ticket hypothesis? Was that kind of like an accidental discovery while studying pruning? Like, or did you specifically, that's kind of my question. It's like, were you looking into pruning and then this just came up and you're like, oh, wow, look at what I found? Um. Kind of. There's a much longer story to how this happened, but you know, this is my first deep learning project, and 
all that happened was, you know, I was reading some papers on pruning and, you know, because I, I was just trying to read various papers on deep learning and found pruning kind of interesting that, you know, maybe there was hope for making these networks simpler because, you know, at that time I didn't have very many resources. I basically just had my laptop because I wasn't doing deep learning research. And so personally, I, I was kind of, it would have been great for me if these networks could be made smaller and more efficient because, you know, I wanted to get to, I wanted to get to join the party. And as a, and I happened to, you know, ask a professor at MIT a question about, you know, why we can prune at the end, but not at the beginning, which is a question that get a, gets asked in a lot of the standard pruning papers everybody tends to cite. And he gave some high level explanation that involved, you know, maybe there's some exploration of the lost landscape. The network kind of learns to memorize and then compresses its representation. I don't remember what exactly it was, but it was something where I went, you know, how would I test this? And what are other possible hypotheses for what's going on? The lottery ticket idea being one of the hypotheses. I kind of sat down at my laptop, uh, coded up a really simple experiment on a neural network with uh, two hidden units for XOR. You can see this in the original V1. If you want to see it on archive, it's public, although thankfully hard to find. Um, and, you know, it started working. I basically, the initial algorithm that, you know, is this iterative magnitude pruning algorithm today started working. And I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And then someone said to me, well, have you tried considering it on a real task? And then I had to go, well, what's a real task? They said, well, you should try MNIST. I was like, what's MNIST? And you can look at the versions <laughs> of the papers and see this repeated over and over and over again for what's CIFAR, what's ResNet, what's ImageNet. And this was really meant to be my excuse to get to learn how to do deep learning and learn a little TensorFlow. And you know, it happened to turn into a very nice paper instead, but that wasn't necessarily the goal when things started. Very cool. Um, so just to kind of pull back quickly, so another kind of popular idea uh, that's been around is kind of the, on double descent. And kind of one of the things that they extrapolate from there is about the overparameterization is necessary because there's noise in the data set that kind of needs to be memorized by the network to allow it to kind of generalize to the rest. How do you think that plays into kind of the lottery ticket hypothesis? It's tricky to say. For starters, you know, I haven't looked into the double descent phenomenon too, too closely beyond the high level ideas, so I don't want to, you know, speak out of turn on that. But I would say that, you know, on all the lottery ticket networks we look at, we're in the wildly overparameterized regime. These networks are kind of in the second descent. Yeah. That's so I'm not sure that it has much to say about the first descent, and I'm not sure it has, I'm not sure how much I would draw connection to the phenomenon in general beyond the fact that, you know, maybe we don't need quite as much overparameterization as we think. Okay, cool. Thank you. So um, I, I wanted to just really quickly, um, when I was making notes uh, on your paper, I drew an optimization surface. And what you're saying in, in this linear mode paper is that you can train for a little bit and then you can, you can fork, you can create two networks and train them separately. And because of the randomness of SGD, they'll go to slightly different places in the optimization surface. And you were saying that it's the, it's the, the loss minimum that's important as opposed to the structure of the network itself, because you're not necessarily saying that the structure will be the same. And my intuition is it's the structure of the network which gives a useful inductive prior. But is your hypothesis that a, a similar position on the loss surface, so if you can linearly interpolate between these two positions, then for all intents and purposes, the network gives the same useful inductive prior? Uh, it's it's hard to necessarily distinguish between the structure and the initialization. That's one of the biggest problems with Lottery Ticket is it would be nice to say it's all about the structure, it's all about the initialization, and yet it's this nasty combination of both. I, With respect to what, let me make sure I understand the question. So whether two networks, if, if they have the linear mode connectivity property, they give the same inductive prior, or the network they started with has the same kind of inductive prior. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, or is that so the right way to understand you, your question? If you, if you have two positions with you know in different places in the loss surface, but they have the same loss, and maybe as as a to strengthen that statement, they also have a linear mode connectivity with with no big uh, you know uh, peaks in the way. Does that mean, for all intents and purposes, they represent the same inductive prior about the data? Um, it depends on what you mean by inductive prior about the data. I would, in terms of. What, what do you mean by inductive prior about the data? I want to clarify that language. Okay, so my conception of the lottery ticket hypothesis is that um, 
what we really want to find is a subnetwork with an initialization which represents something. I mean, an example of an inductive prior might be a CNN, for example, which mm. which understands that there's a there's a local connectivity. So so um, in in networks in general, we're we're learning an inductive prior which might um, increase our, our generalization to new previously unseen data, uh, or you know, giving us some kind of um, adaptivity to other similar tasks. So I'm not sure that I would be able to speak about the inductive prior of a trained network, because in some sense, you know, the network has already, whatever inductive prior you had earlier, the network has in some sense fulfilled. But I would speak about the inductive prior of the network where you made the two copies. So wherever you began the process that ended with linear mode connectivity. And to say that it had the same inductive prior to evaluate that, one would want to look at the functional similarity of the networks to see whether, you know, they actually learned the same thing. And what we find, this is, you know, in the many pages of appendices of the paper, what we find is a complicated story. For the dense networks, they don't really become that much more functionally similar once they achieve, once they get to a place where they'll have linear mode connectivity. For the sparse networks, however, they become much more functionally similar, suggesting that this linear mode connectivity is kind of, in some sense, a stronger property or a stronger prior on the result of the sparse networks, but not necessarily for the dense networks. So, again, there's this kind of the the nature of how this linear mode connectivity of the implications of this linear mode connectivity for different kinds of networks seems to be different and in the sparse context it seems to imply a lot more about the network than it does in the dense context where perhaps there's just a lot more flexibility in where the network goes and what it learns Jonathan do you think the uh, inductive prior on these sparse layers are similar to kind of how the attention mechanism has sort of a sparse connection with its input like uh, that's a big question. The We don't know why sparsity seems to show up in all of these contexts, I think would be the right way of putting it. One can speculate, and I've heard everyone from, you know, grad students to Jeff Hinton speculate about this. Um, and, you know, in, in a language context with attention being sparse, you know, I would guess that, you know, when you attend over a sentence, not every word is crucially important for understanding or for, you know, improving the representation of a particular word. And so perhaps, you know, sparsity in that context makes sense from a linguistic perspective. I'm not a, I'm not a linguist though, so don't, don't take or take what I say with a grain of salt. When it comes to sparsity in the neural networks themselves or why, you know, sparsity tends to sh seem so natural, all I have is uninformed speculation that I can't evaluate, so I don't want to say much more than that. But it seems interesting that sparsity seems to show up in all these contexts. It's kind of unfortunate in a way because we don't have any computational platforms that train particularly well with sparsity, at least that are available as commodity platforms right now. Um, some of the newer chips that companies like Graphcore and Cerebrus are producing have sparsity as kind of a first-class primitive, but GPUs and TPUs don't. But if but my, my kind of research hypothesis is that sparsity seems to be natural to the representations neural networks learn. We can get rid of all these extra connections when we prune or when we do lottery ticket. It doesn't seem to affect accuracy. It doesn't seem to affect a lot of other properties. I have a short workshop paper on interpretability, and it doesn't seem to affect the interpretability of these lottery ticket networks. We're looking at a bunch of other properties in our lab right now, and it just doesn't seem to be having much of an impact, which to me suggests that maybe all the stuff we got rid of really wasn't doing much to begin with. The network wasn't able to take advantage of that. And so perhaps, you know, the representations the networks seem to be learning are in some sense sparse. So on the on the side of this, so mo most of the gain, is it really actualized with the current hardware or, or it's like we're waiting on the graph core, Cerebros? It seems like right now, something we talked about yesterday is that you mat is like you apply this one zero mask, right, to do the pruning. And so like, does that actually like make inference take longer because you have to pass it through the mask or... And then I also think, like, does it speed up training because you can have faster gradient computation because you don't have to, you know, put the gradient through as many weights? But how much of this gain is actualized in modern hardware? So I haven't tried to actualize this gain, I think would be the the honest answer. I've, I'm frankly in it for the science. So to me, it's just exciting to understand, can you make these things, things smaller? And I let people who know a lot more about hardware than me worry about how to make these run fast. But, you know, having talked to people who know a lot more about hardware than me, what they tell me is that actualizing the gains about spar the gains from sparsity is rather hard. You need to be pretty sparse before you even hit the break-even point of training the network with the sparse representation. And depending on who you ask, that could be anywhere from 50% to 90% sparsity, at least on, on commodity-dense hardware. Now, thankfully, and kind of looking toward the future, 
number one, we have lots of great platforms that are coming to fruition now that do run well with sparsity. The first being CPUs. Um, the second being, you know, all these cool new platforms that are coming out from a lot of the startups that are building deep learning hardware that are placing bets on the fact that, you know, sparsity will be the future. So, you know, I happen to agree with their bets. Um, but also, you know, we, there's a spectrum of sparsity. You don't have to be either sparse or dense. And OpenAI, it sounds like, has done a lot of great work on block sparsity, where you can start to take advantage of this because you have you know, some sparsity. You have sparsity, but at a greater granularity. You can do structured sparsity, where you prune parts of the network to try to preserve density. And that doesn't get you to as small of networks as you get from sparse pruning in terms of parameter count. But in terms of real-world wall clock speed up, you can actually just make the tensor smaller and get speed up that way. And you know, there's, a, there's probably also a compiler story here of can we find ways to make sparsity or the sparsity we find run faster. And that's something we're also looking at in our lab right now. So the answer is complicated, but I don't think it's as black and white as you know, sparse equals slow, dense equals fast, and that's the end of the story. At least I hope not for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so one of the things you alluded to in your Sorry, paper... Sorry, Matthew, can't hear you. You're on mute, Matt. Oh. Sorry, one of the things you alluded to kind of in the paper was, uh, well, you did an experiment where you tried and used unsupervised learning and transfer um, the, the kind of a sparse network to the supervised setting. Um, and obviously, it required a lot more data. Do you feel that you could generally achieve uh, lottery tickets from unsupervised settings that would transfer well to their, to say, like ImageNet, et cetera? Or do you feel like it really has to be on the specific data set in order for it to be, kind of be useful? So to answer that question, I would actually defer you to two different papers that have been written by fantastic colleagues at Facebook. Um, one paper that was in NeurIPS this past year looks at whether these lottery tickets transfer between tasks, at least on image tasks, and the answer is yes. If you find one of these on ImageNet, it transfers well to places and CIFAR 100 and CIFAR 10 with relatively little loss in accuracy, which suggests that you know, these, these lottery tickets are kind of still relatively general purpose networks, at least within a family of tasks like you know, natural images, which which also suggests that although it may be expensive to find these lottery ticket networks, if you have a situation where you need to retrain a network often and maybe there's some distribution shift, finding the lottery ticket once is probably going to be good for quite a while. And I'd also defer your attention to a second great paper from my colleagues at Facebook on looking at lottery tickets for self-supervised and unsupervised learning. And the answer is that, yeah, you do find lottery tickets in this setting as well. So I... And this is surprising to me. I would have thought these would be wildly overfit to whatever data set you end up having because you're training and pruning and going back and training and pruning again. You're kind of overfitting both the weights and the architecture. But that seems not to be the case, which to me is both surprising and really exciting because it gives an application to this work. Perfect. So very, very related to this is a, a Reddit question that uh, not Wolfman's brother asks, do lottery tickets exist for all models like GANs, VAEs, and... Neural, neural network architectures like RNNs and ResNets, do they exist for reinforcement learning policies? So are they general enough? So let me start by saying that I would never make the claim that they exist for all networks. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because I don't like to make claims unless I can provide some evidence. The lottery ticket hypothesis is a hypothesis because you know no amount of evidence will ever prove it true. Um, at least no amount of empirical evidence will ever demonstrate it to be true. And when it comes to the specific networks that are mentioned here, there's yet another paper from my colleagues at Facebook that looked at NLP and, or that looked at transformers and RL and found that lottery tickets generally existed for that. That was just presented in iClear on Tuesday. Um, in our iClear paper, we looked at RNNs and found that you know, it seems to work for RNNs as well. For GANs or VAEs, uh, go try it and let me know. Shoot me an email if you find out. I, I would love to, to know. These are different kinds of tasks. They're more complicated tasks. And you know, who knows? If they don't work, that's interesting. And in that it would be interesting to understand why they don't work. And that would tell us a lot more about the nature of neural networks. I love these situations where things fail. And you can find the exact threshold where things fail, because that, that gives you a great opportunity to do some science. John, on the subject of um, like finding lottery tickets in, say, a deeper network, do you suspect that it might not exist at all or that it just takes more rounds of the iterative pruning algorithm to find them? Uh, so on the deeper networks, if you mean at initialization, um, uh, or do you mean in general? Yeah, so like the difference between finding a lottery ticket in uh, like a ResNet 20 compared to like a super big efficient <laughs> is the <laughs> difference that you need to prune it more times? 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think it's really, even if you just do one-shot pruning, so you just prune at the end and go back, um, you still find pretty decent lottery tickets. The reason why we do things iteratively is just that you can shave off a few more weights. It seems to make the process work a little bit better. And so if you wanted the smallest possible lottery ticket or the, or the smallest possible pruned network in general, doing it iteratively tends to work best. But you know that's computationally expensive. And even if you don't do it iteratively, you still find lottery tickets. You just generally can't get quite as small of a lottery ticket that way. I'm sorry, my takeaway was that the one shot is way lagging behind the iterative. Is that not true? Uh, it depends on the setting, and it depends on what you mean by way. Um, so all these vary quite a bit depending on the architecture, the task, everything else. And mm -hmm. you know, we, we tend to plot everything at a logarithmic scale so that you can see the detail um, at the smaller sparsities, but it also kind of exaggerates the differences in outcome between, say, one shot pruning and, and iterative pruning. So it's worth, I would need to take a look at the graphs again to look at that. I haven't done a thorough comparison of the two, but in our paper um, in iClear where we looked at comparing rewinding and fine tuning, um, we, we did end up finding that, you know, things work for one shot, they just work a little bit better. And if you want to get state of the art, you should use iterative. Wanted to explore a little bit on around domain adaptation and adversarial examples and, and also democratization. You said something really interesting about, you know, five or 10 minutes ago, which was that you were doing deep learning on your laptop. And it, it, I, I think this represents the ultimate catch-22 situation because we know that you can create these wonderful pruned lottery tickets, but you still need to do all of the training. So, so first of all, could you talk a little bit about some of, you know, just in general that there are other types of, of um, uh, you know, ways to compress neural networks, things like quantization and distillation. But you, you did make an interesting comment in your linear mode paper, which is that subnetworks found by IMP with uh, rewind uh, transfer between vision tasks uh, better so um, but because of that increase in domain adaptation you're almost amortizing the extra time that you spent create you know finding those lottery tickets in the first place and as, as a as an addendum to that does that have implications um, in terms of resisting adversarial examples or does it make it more prone for adversarial examples so let me see there are a lot of questions here with respect to domain adaptation um, my guess is that given that transfer learning seems to work on these lottery tickets, that you know these should be good even given that the domain of the data shifts a little bit. Um, and I don't know how to quantify a little bit, but it seems like at least within the family of natural image tasks, this seemed to work. I'd be curious to see in an NLP setting where whether you know maybe you can get some good transfer between like machine translation and language modeling or something like that. Uh, that would be interesting and that would tell us a lot. But even you know between language modeling on one data set and language modeling on one on another, or machine translation on one language and another language, it would be interesting to see you know someone work on that and it, it would be cool to find out what would happen. I'd love to read that paper um, with respect respect to adversarial robustness, um, stay tuned on that. There have been a couple papers that have looked at this. I don't think anyone's looked at it quite to the level of depth and rigor I'd like. So um, stay tuned. Keep an eye on archive. <laughs> so um, another question from Reddit, Imnemo asks, suppose you try to construct a lottery ticket by taking all the weights that were not part of a winning ticket and retraining from those. Will that model be unable to learn the task or might there be another winning ticket hiding among them or one, one that wasn't originally used? So this is the most common question I get by people who read the original paper. And I, I hope that by answering it here in a public forum, I can answer it once and for all. Um, the challenge in doing this experiment is let's take the MNIST example. So suppose that we find a winning ticket on MNIST. It's going to be about 3% of the original size of the network. So that means that if you remove it, you've still got 97% of the weights left. And so my guess is that if you were to train those 97% of weights, you'll get to the same accuracy as you got with 100% of weights because you've barely pruned the network at all. You could randomly prune by 3% and it wouldn't affect it. And then you could go and find another lottery ticket that's mutually exclusive with the first, you still have 94% of the weights. And you could probably iterate this for a very long time. Probably, you know, you could. You could probably this way find, you know, 10, 15 lottery tickets like this, maybe more, that are all mutually exclusive and still leave you with a remaining kind of residual that is capable of training to full accuracy. So the challenge with this experiment is that the lottery tickets are small, which is great, but it means that whatever's left is large enough that, you know, I'm sure there's another lottery ticket in there and another lottery ticket in there and so on and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a, 
it's an interesting idea in principle, but <clears throat> once you kind of look at the sizes of things, you've still got so much over-parameterization left that I think you'd you just find more lottery tickets. You can even probably, I'm guessing, swap out one weight from a lottery ticket with another weight, and it wouldn't matter, or swap out a handful of weights. And so combinatorially, the number of lottery tickets is massive, and we're just finding one. It's also like, what would be the application of that, <laughs> finding the second one? <laughs> I mean, it, it, if there were, you know, if if a lottery ticket were really big, like if it were half the network, it would be interesting to see what would happen to the other half of the network. But we know, so if it, it's kind of, it's a size issue more than anything else that, you know, if only we, it would be nice to compare the, the residual here if, if the sizes were commensurate. And I think that's the intuition a lot of people have when they think about this without, you know, looking too hard at the numbers. It's only when you really dig into the numbers that you've, that this idea becomes a little bit less interesting, I think. All right, next question, X1X asks, what are, you, are, what are your views on the recent paper of Malak et al, where they prove the strong lottery ticket hypothesis? And maybe you can uh, formulate that hypothesis in your words. So I don't want to go too far in trying to describe this paper because I will start by saying I'm an empiricist because I'm bad at math. And so reading theory papers is a challenge for me. And for anyone else out there who finds machine learning theory papers challenging, please know that uh, you have a friend and compatriot in that fact. Uh, so I haven't, A, I haven't had time to dig into this paper too deeply, and B, I think the amount of time it would take me to fully understand this paper would be you know longer than it would take me to write another paper. But at a high level, there have been a, a few works that have looked at not, well, the original lottery ticket idea is all about finding a sparse network that optimizes well. And if I recall correctly, if I understood at least the, the setup of the proving the lottery ticket hypothesis paper, this is looking at a randomly initialized subnetwork and how accurate this would be compared to, or whether there exists a randomly initialized subnetwork that could be as accurate as a dense network. And so the optimization process is not taken into account here. And there's some other work that looks on this. There's a paper that looks at, can you find high accuracy networks that are just frozen at their random initializations by, by finding a good pruning mask? And I think this is an interesting set of problems. It's definitely not the original lottery ticket setting as we envisioned it. So, you know, I don't own the brand and people are welcome to use the term lottery ticket or the metaphor of the lottery however they like. But I don't think it's the same problem that I'm looking at. Well, I, I have a bit of a... I have a bit of an issue with papers like this that try to to prove these kinds of things because if I read the abstract right now, um, part of it is uh, showing that for every bounded distribution, every target network with bounded weights, a sufficiently overparameterized neural network with random weights contains a subnetwork with roughly the same accuracy. So it, it turns out when you read these theorems, oftentimes you'll find that this sufficient overparameterization is more than atoms in the universe or something like this. So basically you'll have every single combinatorical combination of whatever you can think of as a subnetwork somewhere in there. And it, it becomes rather unsurprising that there exists something good in there. Um, do, you, do, you, do you know of any work that is really convincing you in that regard where someone is more formal than maybe you would do research? So it's, I don't want to speak too much to theoretical machine learning in general or, theor or theory of deep learning in general, simply because in a lot of senses, it's, it's kind of a, I almost see it as a separate field from what I work in, given that the kinds of empirical networks we look at are, you know, big, they're complicated, they're on real data with, you know, batch norm and residual connections and weight decay and all sorts of other fancy heuristics we've thrown in to make them work properly. And a lot of the models that folks look at in, in these papers are kind of of a different nature. They're infinitely wide, or they're single layer with the second layer frozen, or you know the the notion of the data isn't really, you know, how do you formalize ImageNet in a mathematical way that you can do proofs about it? So in that sense, I don't want to comment too much because I'm I'm not the expert here, so I can't really say you know is that a good bound? Is this thing too big? Is this realistic or unrealistic? I think I find theory work valuable because it, it gives me new ideas and it gives me new insights that I may not have been able to find empirically. It gives me new things to try. The, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the ideas for Lottery Ticket have come from my co-author, Carolina, who you know, does theoretical machine learning, and she's had a lot of great insights 
from that background. But in terms of my ability to distinguish, you know, which which ideas from theory are, you know, perhaps more applicable and less applicable, I'm as ignorant as anyone on that. So it's not my place to comment. Pivoting a little bit uh, on the training batch norm and only batch norm paper, could you tell me like a bit <clears throat> about what inspired those experiments? So this is this is an interesting paper. To give a quick summary of it, um, this is asking the question, you know, batch norm normalizes the activations coming out of a particular unit or a particular convolution, um, but it also multiplies them by a trainable scale parameter and adds a trainable bias parameter. So every time you use batch norm, you're introducing two new trainable parameters per feature. And they're often neglected. And they're often so neglected that when I was trying to run a completely different experiment, I wanted to freeze the weights in the network. And I forgot to freeze the batch norm weights because I forgot they existed. Um, and the network was still training to good accuracy. I didn't understand what in the world was going on or why performance was, you know, this network shouldn't have done anything. And yet it was training to decent accuracy. And finally, someone said, well, you know, did you remember to freeze the batch norm? I went, batch norm has parameters? Um, and hence the paper was born. So I think it's a, and, and this is the one case where I made a horrible mistake and it turned into something good. I don't think that's happened to be otherwise. Usually I make horrible mistakes and just waste a month of time. Um, and that happens a lot. That's why PhD is five years. But, you know, in this case, we happen to find that actually, if you just train these parameters, you can get to surprisingly good accuracy, not great accuracy, not state of the art accuracy. But if you were to poll a random sample of, you know, a thousand machine learning researchers and ask them the accuracy they would think you would get, this would be much better. And a lot of people would think it would just be random accuracy. So that's interesting. In the one sense, it draws attention to these parameters, which I think we often forget in a lot of work on analysis of batch norm, they're left out. They're just they're left out of the analysis because they complicate things. Um, and, you know, I forgot they existed or never knew they existed. So we should know. And, you know, there there are some other possible applications, but I'd have to stretch to do that. It's kind of a it's a fun idea and an interesting piece of science, I think, more than anything else. Is it quick? Because because like, could you imagine it being useful to have just an enormous randomly weighted network and then only train the batch norm parameters? Like, is there a potential application that you see with that? One could imagine it. There's a whole literature on what's called reservoir computing, where all you do is you create random features, and then you learn a linear classifier on top of that. So there's a long legacy in the literature of doing things like this. And it, it seems to work surprisingly well. Again, surprisingly well. like sometimes as well as learning features even. Um, one could imagine this. The challenge comes down to performance. And again, I'm not an expert on you know making things run on the hardware. But <clears throat> you still have to backprop through most of the network to update these batch norm parameters. I have seen, empirically, I've seen some wall clock time speed up when you're only training the batch norm parameters. So maybe there there are some ways to take advantage of this. Maybe just you know memory accesses or I, again really I'm talking out of turn if I say much about how an actual computer works. But you know there is some speed up and I can imagine some application there. But this is really where I'd have to defer to folks who have more expertise than I do. So I've I've got a question about the state of machine learning in general. I mean it's almost depressing in a way that the whole lottery ticket hypothesis, um, the the word lottery seems to have these connotations that it's only by random chance that we get anywhere at all. And if you look at um, even evolution, for example, it, it's this process of trying many, many random things. And it seems perverse. It seems like we're barking up the wrong tree. We should be doing something far more intelligent in order to do learning. And Francois Chalet, in, in his uh, Measuring Intelligence paper, says that we need to take a step away from um, you know, having these closed domain algorithms and moving more towards having a focus on um, you know, the unknown unknowns and adaptability and, and, and open-endedness and so on. So do, do you think that we're stuck in a local mission minimum in the machine learning world? Not really. I mean, the, when it comes to all of these questions, I mean, th the first question I ask is, what is our goal as a community? And if you were to ask that to every individual researcher, you would hear you know, a bunch of individual answers, none of which match each other. Even for a lot of folks who are in the sparsity space with me, that's a very narrow space. All of our goals are completely different. Some folks want performance. Some folks want, you know, like me, I'm interested in the science, and sparsity happens to be a good way of getting at that. So, you know, I'm not a big believer in the fact that you know we should be we should be aiming for these general intelligence robots. I think that's something that you know it's interesting to hear people who don't you know people like Bill Gates or Elon Musk talk about this, um, people who have never trained a neural network in their lives. Um, but 
you know, as far as I'm concerned, deep learning is doing great stuff. I mean, it's driving cars. Um, it's, you know, winning at whatever video game it was. I don't really game, but it's, you know, it seems to be, it, it won at Go and it won at, what, StarCraft? I think that was the one. Um, so, you know, it's it's doing good stuff. It's been a huge advance. So, you know, we should be thrilled that, you know, companies that do AI are actually making money, which is a relatively new phenomenon given all the past AI winters. With respect to, you know, whether we should, you know, make some big change in our approach to the field, it depends on your goal. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. And, you know, it's easy to say that in a lot of senses. Um, if you can tell me the algorithm that we should be using, or you can tell me how to actually go about doing this, you know, go take your Turing Award, go, um, you know, go enjoy completely changing the field. There's a reason this doesn't happen very often. Um, so we have something that works really well. We have something to build on here. As a researcher, I'd like to stay productive, and this is a place where I can, you know, make meaningful progress right now. But, you know, if we want to dump this and go to something else, there are a lot of great researchers out there, and there's not a lot of work to do there because we don't even know where to begin yet. I, th I think Paradigm that's, that's shifts a really... Are hard to do. That's a really interesting response, but I suppose if I was being, if I was playing devil's advocate and being a bit cynical, though, there is this question of what is it that, that you know, these deep learning algorithms, what, what are they doing? And you can argue with this double descent thing that maybe there is a phase change and maybe um, as we train on larger models with larger amounts of data, maybe they really are generalizing in a meaningful way. But if you were being cynical, you could argue that they are just kind of, they're just memorizing everything. And, and you know, it, it, it's almost that there's, there's a gap between between the perception of what these models uh, do and, and the reality. Um, I don't know whether you want to take that or we, we've got um, a Reddit question. Let me, let me take that very briefly. Um, suppose they are working just based on a lot of memorization. Um, I mean, they seem to be working pretty well. That's, I think the bottom line is what are the results? Are they you know, generating meaningful text? Are they able to drive a car relatively safely given other constraints? Are they able to you know, do your image recognition task or save somebody some work? And the answer seems to be in a lot of settings, yes. In a lot of settings, the answer is definitely not. And in those settings, we, we could desperately use something better. But to, to take your question and turn it the other way, you know, if lottery ticket is showing that these networks are way bigger than they have to be, then that means we have a lot of headroom left to push this, this set of ideas further. We have a lot of headroom left to make the most of the parameters we have available. You know, we're, we don't know what we're doing when it comes to neural networks. We don't know how they work. Imagine what we can do if we understand how they work. So to be the optimist here, you know, perhaps we're merely scratching the surface of what this particular set of algorithms can achieve. Or perhaps you know, we can solve a lot of these problems given time to actually do that science. On the other hand, of course, you know, neural networks may be the flavor of the decade, and we should have some new things coming down the pike. But doing that kind of work is hard, high risk, very low reward. And you know, speaking personally, as someone who wants to publish some papers so he can get his PhD and move on with life, um, you know, doing that kind of work is not conducive to my ability to graduate, to be honest. It's, you know, the academic incentive structure is not such that if I spend two decades working on a series of ideas that don't work out, I'm going to get rewarded for that. In some sense, you know, the, the pioneers of neural networks took some very big risks to continue to advocate for this technology for as long as they did, and those risks worked out. But I kind of wonder <laughs> how many folks have done this for similar ideas where the risks have never worked out. So it's, it, it takes some people who are willing to put their careers on the line for this kind of thing to happen. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, let's go to another question from Reddit. Because as an aside, I'm super excited. We've got so much buzz around this conversation today. We've been uh, upvoted nearly 100 times on Reddit, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, Glocken Spiel Cello says he's, uh, he's super interested in whether you've done any simple calculations about the probability and the combinatorics of lottery tickets. And one of the takeaways from the Uber study, which we haven't spoken about yet, seems to be um, that if you believe their results, that the sign of the weight at, at, at initialization is, is the most important characteristic of the ticket. Um, if you buy this model, it would be relatively simple to ask theoretical questions of the form, what percentage of initializations have ticket X as a subnetwork and how many equivalent tickets are in the, the network uh, at initialization? Um, what is the dependence of this probability on depth and width, et cetera? Uh, and, you know, these, so he's, he's saying, is that a direction that you've considered at all? 
so this is let me i have three or four different comments to make about this. but starting with you know our friend glockenspiel cello we don't know whether it's a he or a she and you know so <laughs> we, we, we and and you know I, I say that jokingly but i also do say that seriously you know we are not a very diverse community and you know, we, we should not assume that everybody who's asking a question on Reddit is male, not to call you out or anything, but to take the <laughs> opportunity to just, you know, point that out because it's a, you know, making those assumptions is part of the reason why this community is less welcoming to, to people Absolutely. who identify as women. But to, to get to the actual question here, um, the combinatorics kill you very quickly. What I would love to do is take a lottery ticket and try it on you know 10 billion initializations and even then i still wouldn't be i'd be scratching the surface of this massive distribution of initializations or i'd love to randomly sample 10 billion lottery tickets from a network um i've tried on the order of 10,000 and still haven't found one that works well by randomly sampling which suggests that you know whatever this distribution is it is very unlikely to find a lottery ticket so to try out the combinatorics you have to do a lot of sampling or find some clever way to do it and you know maybe finding clusters of lottery tickets or something like that and any of these are very hard given that the only lottery tickets we know how to find are from one very specific probably bad algorithm with respect to the uber paper the signs observation would in some sense make this easier because it would turn it into a combinatorial problem but the fact remains that it's still the the combinatorics of these subnetworks are just mind-boggling. Even trying to write down what the calculation would be, what a good subnetwork looks like or what a valid subnetwork looks like, has kept me occupied. So we have some thoughts along these lines and we have some ideas we're planning to try soon along this, but it is a very hard problem because those combinatorics just absolutely kill you even on the smallest neural networks. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of really, it's really exciting and Sort of one more thing to, that we wanted to discuss is um, like we talked about the super intelligent robots, Elon Musk style. And then I think everybody in machine learning is familiar with the, you know, caution around it, especially the GPT-2 stage release hype machine. And so could you tell us a bit about tech policy? I, I know it seems like most people, you know, just kind of focus on what they know. And I don't imagine too many machine learning people, you know, know enough about what is happening with tech policy and relating to these advancements. Definitely. So let me briefly tell you what tech policy is, a little bit about what I do and kind of, you know, what you should know if you're, you know, the, the two seconds on that. Uh, policy is, you know, the idea of, you know, creating law, govern, governance structures, kind of, you know, plans for how we should handle these issues or manage the consequences of these issues. These issues could be, you know, anything from healthcare to, you know, the economy to defense. Um, and in this case, it's AI and the effects on society. So I have this whole other life where I work in policy, kind of, I moonlight sometimes as a law professor at Georgetown where I, you know, teach students there. I work with journalists, work with policymakers, been working with the OECD, which is kind of a UN style international organization, trying to be kind of the voice of technical expertise in a lot of these conversations. I think we all kind of complain in the back of our minds that, you know, these darned politicians, they don't, you know, they're all old, they don't know about computers, they don't know how technology works. Um, and it's easy to complain it's hard to actually help. Um, it's, it's a lot harder to actually take some action and make yourself useful in that. And it's hard for many reasons. It's hard because, first of all, you know, you have to actually be willing to help solve a problem instead of just complaining about it. But more than that, it's hard because a lot of policy revolves around trust, revolves around building relationships, and revolves around putting your ego aside. Um, I think in the in computer science and especially in AI, we like to think that we know better than everyone else. We could disrupt your industry. We can reinvent what you were doing in this really labor intensive way with an algorithm. We can you know, replace your worker with AI. And this hubris leads us to believe that we can reinvent the wheel on anything and do it better than the experts. Um, you know, when it comes to, say, fairness or, you know, law. These are issues where, you know, it turns out there's some pretty well-trained experts who have been studying this question for a thousand years, if not more. Um, perhaps we should listen to them. And so we have to put aside our opinions and do a lot of listening, which seems to be pretty hard for some folks in the machine learning community right now. Um, and that's what it takes just to get in the door. But to actually make an impact, you have to learn the language of policy. But the reward is, you know, in a lot of these conversations, there often isn't a technical expert in the room. And if you're willing to go through all those steps, you can be that technical expert. And in doing so, make the policy better, solve the problems that you spent a lot of time on Twitter complaining about. So I think this is a huge issue. We're creating technology. It's risky. It's dangerous. We're not taking the proper precautions when we let it out. We think that it's somebody else's problem to deal with the consequences. 
Can, can you that, bring this to life a, a little bit? So um, you're, you're talking about uh, policy. So give me an example of where could we have the most impact? Because just based on what you were saying at the end there, it seemed like you were talking about some of the um, the ethical problems with um, AI, such as fairness and, and, and bias and discrimination and, and so on. Uh, are, are you talking far more generally than that? I'm talking far more generally than that. I think anything that we put out into the world, whether it's AI or otherwise, any technical system, you know, has societal consequences. You can look at, you know, the fake news issue. You can look at, you know, the the whole filter bubble question. You can look at every time that a major company has put out a product they've had to retract because it had some huge privacy violation. Think Google Buzz, if anybody remembers back that long. I was in high school back then, but uh, it was a big deal and then it disappeared all of a sudden and turns out the federal government shut it, had Google basically shut it down. Um, but in AI in particular, where we're making decisions based on data, we don't understand how those decisions work. We don't understand the heuristics, the biases, the memorization that's going into these decisions. And these decisions are having real effects on real people's lives. We can take credit scoring. A lot of companies are now using neural networks to do credit scoring. That's whether somebody can buy a house, get a loan, buy a car, go on with their life. And you're putting it in the hands of an algorithm where you don't know what it does or facial recognition that a lot of police departments are using. This is an issue I've worked on extensively, but a police department is using this to figure out who they should, you know, add to the list of suspects, who they should investigate. You're putting people's life and liberty into the hands of this crappy neural network that you trained on a data set of celebrities who are all white. <clears throat> what are you doing? Think about it. And on the other hand, from the policy side, how do we regulate this? How do we make sure that your stupid algorithm that you trained in your basement and sold to your local police department, that doesn't happen? Or that algorithm is verified to make sure it's actually good? These are, you know, these aren't small questions. These are, again, people's lives and people's freedom are in the hands of, you know, some quick decision you made about how you were doing data augmentation or what data set you were using. Think about it. Think before you act. I mean, come on. Do you see a fundamental conflict, though, let's say, between, uh, I mean, machine learning is, is so fascinating, but it, the, the machine learning models are fundamentally designed to discriminate. And politically, there is a kind of dichotomy between the quality of opportunity and the quality of outcome. So do, do you, are you fundamentally conflicted in this regard? Or do you think that there is a clear road ahead? No, I think, I mean, look at any application, or any application of decision making in society. Let's take car insurance in the United States, you know, this is a place where you're trying to guess who is most likely to get in an accident um, and, you know, assess them a certain insurance cost to make up for the fact that they're going to crash their car with a certain likelihood. Um, you're allowed to charge men more than women. And, you know, as a as a teenage boy, I was charged a lot more than my older sister was for car insurance when I learned how to drive because teenage boys tend to get into a lot more accidents, and that's legally allowed discrimination. If you were to do the same thing for hiring or housing or anything else, you're not allowed to discriminate. But in credit scoring, in many cases, we are allowed to discriminate between people who are more credit worthy and less credit worthy. You just can't do it based on race. And you shouldn't, you know, this hopefully race should not be correlated with your credit decisions. So, we choose what we allow and don't allow you to discriminate by. Otherwise, you know, if you don't discriminate, you're not making a decision. So, so but th there is a bit of a moral minefield. It, it was great that you brought up the car insurance one. Or, or the, the great thing about the, the car insurance example is it doesn't touch any of the um, immutable characteristics like race and gender and so on. But um, sorry, gender is not immutable. I got that wrong. But um, <laughs> young males who have lots of testosterone will drive more aggressively and they'll get into lots of accidents and you could argue that that's fair or you just argued that it was unfair so did, and is that different or does does that kind of moral problem generalize to the rest of policy Oh, this is a this is a huge moral problem throughout policy. And these are moral problems we've been grappling with for centuries. This isn't, you know, a new problem because AI or computers have come around. This has been a question about credit scoring for decades. And we have, you know, in the US, we have laws around fair credit to decide what you can discriminate based on and what you can't. And this, these are questions we have to adjudicate as a society through, you know, through our societal discussions, through the policy process, through the lawmaking process. And so these are decisions that are being made in specific domains constantly. And, you know, these are tricky questions. The whole issue of affirmative action in college admissions, is that unfair? Is that fair? You know, the, this has been debated since affirmative action was, you know, come up with as a concept. And, it, you know, it's been working its way through the court systems in the U.S. in recent years yet again. So 
these are questions to which we don't necessarily know the answers, but they're questions when we do machine learning we should think about, and we should ask the experts, ask the people who have actually thought about this. Don't go and try to you know, decide for yourself what you think is or isn't fair. Go talk to people who actually think about this and understand the historical context in which you are trying to develop this algorithm. I guess the, the, the issue that comes in new with AI and machine learning is when you say something like, you're not, you're not allowed to discriminate based on race, the, uh, the, you can't tell that to the AI algorithm, right? There needs to be a process to distill what you mean uh, by that into, into an AI algorithm. So I, I appreciate that, that you and other people are actually looking into this. Uh, because that that is a, like an intersection of ethics and, and machine learning that is probably inaccessible to most people of both regions. Uh, but I, I I would actually, if I can make one more one comment on what you've just said, to you can't tell, but you can test. Yeah, you can test like crazy. Can, is your facial recognition algorithm biased? Well. Let's run it through a bunch of data. That's actually what the U.S. government does for a lot of these algorithms these days, is you can submit it to the government and they'll evaluate it on millions of photos that the State Department has collected to see, you know, what your, you know, whether you have biases based on nation of origin, which in a lot of cases correlates with race. And with respect to, you know, not not having mutual understanding of these questions, it's not that hard to understand these questions. I think we just have to be willing to put aside our hubris. And so I'd challenge anyone who's listening to, you know, go learn about these issues and all their complexity and just keep that in the back of your mind. Is, um, is, is there a difference between the, the car insurance one? Because it's very because even if you test it afterwards and even in the UK, we have equality legislation. You're not allowed to discriminate on gender, but it's still more expensive to get car insurance as a man because every other field in their model is a proxy for gender, just the type of car and, you know, how expensive the car is and so on. Um, so but there, there's a difference because you gave the example of, uh, well, a facial recognition model shouldn't be racist and we should check for that. Well, well, of course, but the car insurance model will always be biased. That's correct. And this is where I think we have to we have to do the best we can is really what it comes down to. And you know, there there are trade offs here that have to be adjudicated by a regulatory agency. To what extent can you be biased on the basis of this other information? Do we, th and this gets into, I think, a lot of the fantastic work going on in machine learning and fairness right now, where folks are trying to come up with different definitions of fairness that make these trade-offs explicit so that policymakers have a more concrete language in which to specify what is and isn't acceptable. These are questions that are going to get adjudicated by the policy process. But I think the important part is they're going to get adjudicated by the policy process. They should not be getting adjudicated by us, the people who are making the algorithms, who don't necessarily have the domain expertise, or who shouldn't be speaking on behalf of society as a whole, the way the policy process in its idealized form does. Um, so to, to maybe, because we, we've gone off a bit <laughs> from the lottery <laughs> ticket hypothesis, so I mean, thank, thanks for all of that work. Um, to come back, maybe this is my, my last question, and uh, already in advance, I have to say, uh, to everyone on Reddit who asked a question, thank you very much. Uh, we obviously don't have the, the, the capacity to go through all of them, but thanks and sorry if yours wasn't part. So my last question would be to go back to research. And as we all know, science is different from research. Science is our ideal process and the questions we ask and so on. And research is, I'm a PhD student and I have to put out papers and I have to do things, right? And um, so if you, if you think back, maybe a uh, young PhD researcher, maybe not too many resources, do you have like a list of here are the top three things that, you know, you should pay attention to, to, to be successful in the research world. Like here are, here's the, here's the really important things for you to not be completely frustrated and drop out of the field. Uh, I'd be a hypocrite if I were to say very much on this, uh, about three weeks before the initial lottery ticket results came in, I was on the phone with a with a mentor of mine asking whether I should drop out of my PhD. So, <laughs> and you know, uh, PhDs are hard, and there are a lot of moments where, you know, I've thought about leaving. The what I always told myself was, 
you know, the only way that I'm going to be able to make this five-year commitment and get through it is if I remind myself that I can leave at any time and, you know, no harm, no foul. So it's, this is hard stuff. Getting started is tough. Working with limited resources is impossibly difficult. And, you know, I, I have very painful memories of a lot of moments during my PhD where things weren't working. I felt like I had no direction. Um, and the answer is in a lot of ways to keep digging. I think that as happened for me and as happens for many people, you know, our research direction comes unexpectedly when you go down some rabbit hole and never come back out. And in this case, it was, you know, let me try this small pruning experiment and go down this rabbit hole and see what happens. There were a lot of failed research efforts of all sorts of kinds before that. I mean, my my wonderful advisor, Michael Carbon, uh, he's my fourth advisor during my PhD. And so there's been a long road of, of failure prior to this project and after this project and, you know, continuing to persist and continuing to explore and try to ask interesting questions and evaluate them with whatever resources you have. I found that when I had interesting results, it earned me the ability to get better resources by, you know, showing someone who had some credits to give away or who had a few dollars to spend or who had a couple of GPUs they could let me borrow. And the original lottery ticket paper was written in that way with borrowed GPUs and, you know, a lot of a lot of struggle to get things to run at the scale that I had available. So, you know, research is really hard and I wish I could give advice that would, you know, make it all easier. I can give empathy, which is that, you know, I've been there and I continue to be there every single day. So, uh, Jonathan, what are you reading at the moment? Uh, if, if, if you were to give us your information diet and tell us about its velocity and diversity <laughs> and various sources, um, I'd be fascinated to know. Um... I mean, I tend to, I read fewer papers than I'd like to read. The reason being that, you know, if you tried to read all the papers, you'd never do any research. And so there's a trade-off there. Um, and I feel like once I've gotten a good research direction, it's important for me to read papers that are kind of relevant and in that narrow area, and then read a smattering of papers that people find interesting beyond that area. But it is hard to curate and figure out what papers you should be reading, what papers you shouldn't. Um, and generally, when I go into a new problem, I find one paper that everybody seems to be talking about and then read everything that cites it and everything that it's cited and kind of do a breadth first search outwards like that. And it's generally a good way to understand what the area is, what the questions are, what the conversation has looked like. And from there, you can you can orient yourself. But I don't think machine learning is, you know, I don't think it's really one field anymore. Even deep learning is one field anymore. So, you know, I haven't read really any papers about GANs because it's not something that I study very closely. I don't know a lot about reinforcement learning because it's not something that I study closely. And if I were to try to keep up with all those fields, I wouldn't have time to keep up with my research or the things that are most relevant to the problems I'm most interested in right now. If I wanted to pivot at some point, I'd read a bunch of papers on that topic and try to get up to speed. But I think the, you know, I read papers, I read abstracts a lot of the time, even if I don't read the paper. And I ask my friends what they're reading, and we, we share and we, we dig into these kinds of things. I participate in reading groups. Um, but it's, I think it's really challenging to have a good information diet. And it always feels like you're, you're on this treadmill where you can never read enough or never read everything. And next week, there's going to be another big paper that may change the game. So I think even you found during this call, I haven't read everything there is to read related to lottery ticket because you know there's so much to read. And understanding all of that would require you know, building a bunch of background in theory that I may not necessarily have or may not come easily to me. So I, I don't know if that really answers the question <laughs> effectively, but for all those folks who feel a little overwhelmed by this, I empathize and it's a challenge for me every single day. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. Uh, Jonathan, um, oh, sorry, I, I was sure. muted. Um, uh, that, that's absolutely great, Jonathan. I mean, just, just to finish off, I mean, first of all, th this has been uh, so wonderful. Thank you so much. But ju just as, as a finishing question, uh, Tim, it's pretty... where, where do you see yourself in five years' time? And if you could go back to the younger Jonathan, what advice would you give yourself? So I, I didn't, which Jonathan were you talking about in the second half of your question? I didn't quite catch that. I'm sorry. If you could go back in time and give your younger self advice, what would you say? Um, let me see. So for the, where do I see myself in five years? Gosh, I hope I'm still doing interesting scientific research on deep learning or whatever, 
whatever may come next or whatever we find to be exciting at that point. The field moves fast and I'm under no pretenses that deep learning is something that you know, will necessarily stand the test of time, especially that lottery ticket will stand the test of time. I like to say that, you know, if we're still talking about lottery ticket in five years, that's a really bad sign for the field because we haven't made the progress to understand, to gain some better understanding. So I hope this is a paper that is long forgotten because we've, you know, we as a field have made further progress in understanding what's going on. And I hope to be a part of that. Um, as to where and when and how, you know, I'll hopefully be on the job market next year. So, you know, <laughs> You want to hire me? Please let me know. It sounds like the economy is going to be rough, so I'd love to have a job when all's said and done. Um, so I'll make that shout out right now. As to you know, past me, uh, I always wish I could say to past me, take more math classes. I you know I'm I'm taking a lot of hardcore math classes now late in my PhD because you know you can never have enough math and it always gives you new insights. Um, I would say be patient because a lot of things take a long time to develop and research especially. You fail a lot before you ever succeed once and then you fail a lot more before you ever succeed again. Uh, you know, don't go to that one soccer game where you had the concussion. Otherwise, you know, it's <laughs> the, the last thing I would say is be open-minded to lots of different fields and lots of different opportunities. Deep learning, I've only been doing deep learning, I hit my two year anniversary last month. Um, I haven't been doing this very long. Before that I was trying to be a cryptographer, before that I was trying to be a computer security person, before that I was trying to do law, I was teaching at a law school for a year. Um, before that I was doing programming language theory, before that I was doing distributed systems. Um, you know, it. I would never have thought that going to a law school to teach for a year would lead me to do deep learning research and end up writing the lottery ticket paper. So, you know, it's a PhD and a research career are not a straight path and enjoy the journey. Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, um, I, I know I can speak for many people uh, by saying that your work has been a huge inspiration. So just keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for coming on the channel and uh, we'll see you soon, I hope. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Take care.